Good, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, and I really want to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me as part of this conversation between uh, the geometers present here and um, probabilists. And uh, so, I'll, of course, I'll emphasize some kind of um, probabilistic problems that have led to geometrically interesting configurations. Uh, so the main topic I want to discuss is uh, methods of fair allocation and the, uh, and the resulting geometries. So um, this is part of a topic I've been, um, I have worked on for about uh, 10 years with uh, Alexander Holroyd, who's also at Microsoft, but uh, um, through the through the years, uh, Robin Pimantel, Oded Schramm, Chris Hoffman have uh, participated in this, and uh, as I'll come later to collaboration with others um, on this problem. So, what you see here, yes, oh, is there? There should be a microphone, no, but it's just for the recording. Yeah. Uh, okay. Ah, so I assume. So uh, let me start with one scheme. Um, all right, here we go. So the basic topic that we'll see from different approaches, we have a uh, random array of points. The pictures will be finite, but it's good to imagine that this random array of points extends um, throughout the whole plane or the whole all of space. Um, so, but formally you can think of taking a very large cube, putting uh, points at random there, one per unit volume, and passing to a limit as the cube goes to infinity. Of course, in the pictures we'll only see finite cubes. So what do you, um, and then usually they'll be wrapped around. So what you see in this example is uh, 500 points thrown at random. These are the centers, so uh, we'll call them centers or stars to distinguish them from other points. And uh, the basic problem which we'll see different approaches for is how to allocate in a kind of distributed way uh, to each one a unit of area. So we assume that you know the area is exactly 500 and the number of points is 500. How each point gets its fair share and the method that uh, created this picture, you can think of each point as growing a, s a sphere around it at unit rate and capturing all the area that it reaches first until it is sated. Okay? So some points, like some centers like this one, uh, are lucky. They get sated within a short distance uh, around them. But other points that are, other centers that are hemmed in uh, have to go further. So for instance, uh, if you, uh, so there are, there are many examples of this, but which, uh, which one which is, uh, you know, which is easy to see. Um, so even this one, see it gets some area around, but then it's, you know, it it doesn't get its full share, so the disk keeps growing, and eventually it completes its area quite far away. And whenever you see in this picture some kind of low curvature disk, it signifies that some center had to wait a very long time until it got its unit of area. But eventually, everyone is everyone does get sated because there is exactly one point per unit area. So a point can control a disconnected set of... Exactly. Okay. Exactly, yes. Uh, so uh, so g uh, other methods will yield connected sets, so different methods have different uh, features. Um, so this method has some virtue of stability, so as I'll explain, it's related to uh, the gale shapley stable marriage algorithm, uh, which so, uh, so, th so this this part of the talk is um, based on joint work over several several years and papers, as I mentioned, with Chris Hoffman, Ander Holroyd, Robin Pimantel, and and Oded Schramm. Um, so, again, 
this is the setup. We have points and uh, points and s so we'll call these points centers and the other ones sites just to distinguish them. So the centers are ones that will want to get their unit of volume and um, so formally when we take these boxes, put uniform points on them and take the limit as the box goes to infinity, this converges to the Poisson process. But it's fine for purposes of this talk to just think of this limiting procedure as getting the points. Um, now, really for most of this, the points could arise in many different ways. And uh, so you could, for instance, take a lattice and put random translations, so every lattice point move it independently, that will give a different kind of uh, collection of random points. Or there is another kind of point process that's very important in this type of problem has arisen from random analytic functions. So you take a series like this, sum a and z to the n, normalized by root n factorial, and uh, where the ANs are complex... What? Is there? Oh, oh, sure, sure. So, so if you look at this, at this power series, where the ANs are complex normals, so each Um, so, I have to mention this here for several uh, reasons, as you'll see. So each, uh, each AN is independent and its real and imaginary part are just independent Gaussian random variables. And if you look at this series, it has the remarkable feature that the zeros are, uh, have a translation invariant distribution. So uh, this series has been investigated um, quite a lot. Uh, key names in are Sodin, Tirolson, Nazarov, uh, Volberg, and it's also highly related to earlier work of uh, Schiffman and Zeldich. And, but, uh, so as I'll, I'll come later to say that this series has played a role, so the zeros of this, as I said, are a translation invariant process, and um, Okay, so, so uh, as I mentioned, we want a fair allocation, so meaning almost every site should be allocated to some center, and the territory allocated to a center should have volume one. So, I told you how we want to create this partition that you saw in the picture by this ball, ball growing procedure. Uh, one problem when you try to formalize it is, uh, especially when working in infinite space, each, the process, uh, the volume allocated to each center, well, that depends on the volumes allocated to other centers, because if they reach some area first, then this center can't get it. And those in turn depend on others and so on. And uh, we have examples of processes that are, seem to be defined this way, but actually don't exist. So one has to be careful in defining a process with infinitely many, um, which has infinitely many sub-processes all evolving in the continuum, each one depending on the others, that some naive definition that you might think makes sense actually doesn't. So, uh, um, so to rigorously construct this process, it's good to observe that if it existed, what properties must it have? And then we actually use these pro properties in the construction. And the property it must have is stability. So uh, what, would be, what would be an instability? So we're looking for alloca an allocation psi. And an instability would be a center and a site, here in this picture, psi and x, that prefer each other to the, their current, some of their current partners. So what does that mean? Xi prefers X to, uh, so, so in this imagine, you know, in this imagined allocation, Xi prefers X because it's closer to it than, than this site, and X prefers to be allocated to Xi than to this faraway center. So this would be an instability. 
in the sense that each, both the centers and the sites have their preferences here just according to distance, and an instability would be a center and a site that prefer each other to some of their, to their partners, or for the center it's to some of its allocated uh, area. It seems like a continuous analog of the stable marriage. Exactly, it's a continuous analog. So, so uh, already in the original, I'll come back, already in the original Gail Shapley paper they discussed about, you know, college admissions as a version, uh, uh, many to one version of the, the problem. So, um, so the point is, if you think of the this this kind of instability, it can't. So, if this informal ball growing procedure I described to you, if it uh, is to make sense, it cannot create this kind of instability because if this um, uh, uh, right, if this x. Uh, xi, as the ball, it grows the ball, it will reach x before this center reaches x. So the only, the only reason uh, xi might not take x into its territory is either it's already sated, but then it, if it's already sated by distance x, it wouldn't take this point. Or the other possibility is x is already taken at that point. But if x is already taken at that time, then it can't be captured by this further center. Okay, because if x is already taken, it means it's been taken by some closer center. So this kind of instability can't arise. So if the ball growing procedure exists, it must create a stable allocation. So we can now turn this on its head and ask, well, can we find some stable allocation. And then, um, and if it's unique, then that's what has to correspond to this procedure I described to you. And, and indeed, for any invariant point process, there is a unique stable allocation. So this differs from the classical uh, Gale Shapley setup where you can have more than one stable matching, and I'll explain why, where this difference arises from. Um, what so does A period, S period mean? In the theorem? Uh, uh, almost surely. So okay. with probability one. Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks. Okay, so let me quickly remind you of this, uh, remind you, tell you of this, uh, classical Gale Shapley paper. This is, by the way, the m most highly cited paper in the monthly ever, you know, 1962. <laughs> and um, so, so the basic setup uh, has, well, either uh, men, men and women or colleges and students. Uh, each side in this each side has some preference ordering over the other side. And the original problem that actually David Gale had for, uh, is, is the one who thought of this uh, setup, what is to find a stable matching. So stable meaning that there is no instability. So again, an instability is a pair, uh, in, this case, in this case a man and a woman, who prefer each other to their assigned partners in the matching. Okay, so already the simplest, already the simplest case shows you that you could have non-uniqueness. That is, if this is an invisible color, if you have, if these are the preference. So if you have just uh, say two men, one and two, and two uh, women, A and B. If these are the preferences uh, for the men, and these are the preferences for the women, meaning the arrow points to the most preferred then um, in this case both both possible matchings will be will be stable so so the stable matching in general is not unique and originally it was a problem whether it even exists because as pointed out in the Gale Shapley paper if you think of a roommate problem so you have n people and they want n is even you want to divide in pairs and uh, you know to to become roommates, and again, each person has uh, ordering over the over the others. Then, in the roommate problem, there need not exist. You can just find this simple example with uh, already with uh, four people that there need not exist a stable um, a stable partition. So, and similarly, they generalize it to the setup of colleges and students. Every college has 
an ordering over the students, student has uh, ordering over the colleges, and um, this time, you know, every college has capacity to admit many students, but still the notion of stable allocation is the same as before. We don't want an instability, and there is a stable allocation. In general, it's not unique. <coughs> um, while not widely used for colleges and students, it actually this method is used to assign residents to hospitals. Um, so, so what is the Gale Shapley? Uh, what is the Gale Shapley algorithm? Uh, so, I'll in the original setup, say in the men and women, each each man proposes to his preferred to the fir first woman on his list. <coughs> Each woman rejects all but the preferred man, the most preferred man that has applied, but uh, that has proposed. But uh, but to the to the top one, she doesn't say yes. She just says maybe. Rejects all the others. All the others go to the next on their list and propose to her. And then again, each woman reassesses all the, uh, all the current proposers, rejects all but the top proposer, and this process continues until uh, every woman has a unique proposer. And that has to be a stable matching. You can easily see that an instability couldn't arise in this algorithm. And again, the version of this algorithm is actually used for the resi assigning residents to hospitals. But actually, note that there are two v v versions, whether the uh, men propose or the women propose. And this, in general, will lead to different stable matchings. It leads to the same if and only if there's a unique stable matching. If a now, woman says maybe to a man, does he go on proposing or he also No, waits? no, he, he waits. He waits also. Right, because uh, she, yeah, she is on the top. She is on the uh, his preferred choice, except for those who have already rejected him. So he he will wait. Um, so so the same. Uh, so the same thing can be used in our setting. So each site, so these are the points in the in the plane, applies to the closest center that has not rejected it. Okay, so say this here is a site or a bunch of sites. They've applied to this center and this center, but been rejected. So they apply, you know, next apply to this one. Um, and each each center rejects any of the current applicants um, that are that are too far. Namely, it if it had so it just wants a unit of area. So if it had more than a unit of area of applicants, it rejects all but the closest unit of area. Okay, and those those applicants continue to other centers. Okay, and this, and you just iterate this, and and then the one thing that needs to be proved is that for almost all sites, so points in the in the plane or in space, they will only be rejected finitely many times. So eventually they will stop being rejected, and then that's the center they'll be allocated to, and and uh, and this is a picture of the stage one applications. So you can see what you see in the stage one application is just the Voronoi tessellation. Every s to every center, the applicants are just the closest, uh, the closest sites. Um, so, so that'll just give you the Voronoi tessellation. Then this is the stage one short list. So every center rejected, uh, every center that got more than a unit of area of applicants rejected all but the closest unit of area. And then this is a stage two short list, stage five, and you know in the limit this is the picture we get. And this because it's a discrete procedure it's much easier to analyze and show that it does converge. So, so again the proof that the proof that this is stable is the same essentially as in the original Gale Shapley, Gale Shapley algorithm. Um, the fact that every center is sated and almost every site is allocated takes a little more work and needs the translation invariance of the process. So I won't go through it slowly, but just mention that just having density one is not enough. If you look at a lattice, 
and remove one point from the lattice and now run this algorithm there, then this is the kind of picture you'll get. And it has this, so this is the lattice point that was removed and there's a big hole around it, but there actually are infinitely many small holes that arise here as well. So, uh, but this doesn't happen at all if you have a translation invariant process. Um, so, some geometric facts that we do know about this process, and you know, can, uh, all these papers are available in the archive, and if you want to see more. So each center uh, has a territory of finitely many bounded components. Um, maybe I'll sk skip this. And <coughs> let's mention that in order to understand the long-range correlations of this model, it's good to think of it inside a family of models with an extra parameter, uh, uh, alpha, which is the appetite of every, of every center. So the centers have density one, one per unit area, but now imagine they have an appetite alpha which could vary. So for, uh, for alpha less than one, the picture is subcritical, so there'll be some leftover area for alpha bigger than one. Not every, that's maybe the appetite, but not every center can be uh, sated. So here's the picture for appetite point two. Um, this is point eight. This is appetite one, what you've saw, seen before. Now, initially we might think that the picture would get more and more wild as the appetite grows, but in fact the wildest picture happens at the critical case, alpha equals one, as the appetite grows, then these regions actually become more compact in the sense that the, uh, the fraction of area that's far away from the allocated center goes down. And you can see that the, the case appetite infinity, so a center is never sated, uh, just reverts to the Voronoi tessellation again, which uh, these are you know nice polygons with uh, exponential tails on the distance. So the, the chance that uh, center has a site allocated further than r away decays exponentially in, the, in this case, in the Voronoi case, but it decays only like a power law at criticality. And what we know is alpha equals one is the only parameter where we have power law decay. At all other parameters it's exponential, actually exponential in radius to the d. So Could you say again please what appetite <coughs> means? I didn't yes, so, uh, thanks. So, <coughs> uh, appetite means when a center gets sated. So if you want to think in the uh, process of, of uh, growing balls, uh, the, uh, s uh, every center has a ball growing around it. It captures all the area it reaches first until it is sated. It's sated when it reaches area of alpha. That's this appetite parameter. And it also plays a similar role in the gale shapley algorithm, just every center when it gets applications, it will reject all but the alpha closest area. Okay, so in appetite infinity, a center just gets everything that's closest to it, so it gets the Voronoi tessellation. Um, so, So, in, okay. uh, so the key thing is when alpha is not critical, when alpha is not one, you have very good control of the distance uh, that a, sen a center can get. Or here we're think parameterizing a different way. Look at the origin, which is just a typical point here, and see how far is it allocated. Where is the center that the origin is allocated to? So that's this x. And if alpha is different from one, that then x has uh, better than exponential decay. So this expectation of e to the x to the d is finite. While at criticality, there are power laws, though the exact power law is known only in dimension one. So even, uh, so uh, in dimension two, we know it's a power law, but what power is not known. So. Let me, let me show you at least a proof why the uh, domains allocated to every center are bounded. So this is a, 
proof that employs just you know the tiniest bit of geometry, and it's interesting because it shows that domains are bounded without giving any bound <laughs> on how you know how big they actually are. So. Uh, so say that the center is bad if uh, if it has an unbounded territory. If points arbitrarily far out get allocated to the center, and if there were bad centers, then because everything is translation invariant, then the ergodic theorem or Poincaré recurrence would tell us that there would be bad centers everywhere. So we would have positive density. In particular, each of these sectors would have to have bad centers as well and then <laughs> what you so uh, put e this is a sector is less than 60 degrees and you put a bad center in each of these and now because of the definition of a bad center that it gets area from arbitrarily far out these centers kind of block the middle center from getting any area so any any sites outside this outside this disk they can't be allocated here because they always will have another bad center that's closer and this bad center is still hungry. So it will, uh, by the definition of bad center, it will still want this area and this area, so by stability, it can never be allocated to this one, contradicting the fact that this center got area arbitrarily far out. Is this an appetite one? Uh, this, is, this is appetite one, yes. Okay, so let me skip this and uh, <laughs> there are two other allocation schemes I want to tell you about. So, <laughs> so this is an allocation with connected territories. Unfortunately, <laughs> we don't know they're bounded, although they seem to be bounded. And uh, this one was constructed by Maxime Cricun. And let me just quickly tell you what's the idea of this one. So, uh, so in this process, you start. So you start with the with the infinite collection of points, these random Poisson points. Then you build uh, you build a minimal spanning tree on these points. So, so this is. So we know what a minimal spanning tree on a finite set of points is, right? Just a spanning tree where the total edge length is as small as possible. What does a minimal spanning tree mean here? Well, how do you construct, if you have a finite set of points, that's one of the easiest algorithmic problems to construct a minimal spanning tree. The greedy algorithm works. You can, um, you can put in, <coughs> uh, so you can put in every, you can put in every edge that's so um, let me put it this way so um, you can put in every edge unless there is a cycle where this edge is heaviest in the cycle so every edge so if you think of initially potentially all edges are there uh, you rem uh, remove any edge that's the heaviest in a cycle. Okay, that's one way to think of uh, constructing the minimal spanning tree. So, uh, so you see that in the finite case, if you remove every edge that's the longest in a cycle, then you cannot have any cycles. And in the finite case, it's easy to see that you'll still have a connected graph this way. Uh, in the infinite case, it's not, it's not immediate. So this is a theorem of Ken Alexander that if you do the same process in two dimensions, so, so put in every edge where there's, uh, unless it's the longest in some cycle, that still leaves you with a connected tree. Okay? So you start with this tree, this minimal spanning tree, and this is what you see here in black. Okay, that's this minimal spanning tree. Now. The complement of this tree is simply connected. So Riemann mapping theorem applies and you can map the complement of the tree to the upper half plane. Really, this is a nice case to think of the, you know, the power of the Riemann mapping theorem because if you think of 
you know, this infinite tree going in space in, because usually, you know, when we teach the Riemann mapping theorem, um, you know, we draw some nice domain where you can kind of see how you're going to bend the domain and move it to this. But if you if you think or draw in a large scale this infinite expanding tree, and think, how am I going to construct this conformal map that's going to work and map this to the uh, upper half plane? It's, I mean, there are algorithms, but it's a little, uh, a little scary to think, you know, don't I get run into problems? But of course, the complement of the spanning tree um, is simply connected because of the tree property. You can't have, and it's connected, so you can't have, um, so it's. Uh, so you can't have any um, uh, non-trivial homotopy. So the so there is a mapping. Uh, there is a mapping to the upper half plane, and the the vertices get mapped to points on the line, except that every vertex will be mapped to several points on the line, right? According to the number of uh, adjacent domains, and w and say here every center wants a unit of mass or a unit of area, so we're going to just subdivide the area between the different. So here, this one wants a unit of area. It has one, two, three adjacent domains. So so this one will be mapped by the Riemann mapping, by the Cartesian extension theorem, or the Cartesian. By the Cartesian theorem, this uh, you'll get um, the mapping ex will extend to the boundary. This point will be split to uh, three uh, to three points in the image, and each one of those image points will want mass one third. That will be its appetite. Now, you run the um, this stable allocation algorithm that I showed you before. You run this in the upper half plane with using the Euclidean metric in the upper half plane, but the area measure coming from this side. So we have this Riemann mapping. <laughs> so every center here starts to grow this disk around it, but it decides whether it's sated or not when it gets the right area in the pre-image. Okay, so if this one wants area of one third, this area is not measured here, it's measured back here. But the distances are measured in Euclidean metric here. And when you do that, it's easy to see that every point here will get this full, uh, will have preference on this line. So it will get every point on this line that it prefers, it will have precedence over any, over any other center here. So it will, so its region will contain as much of this line as it wants, and then, and from that it's not hard to see that it will get a connected region. What is hard to see and is still not rigorously proved is that the regions allocated this way will be bounded. Once you find them, you can map them back using the Riemann mapping, and this is, uh, you know, some picture of what you get. The domains seem very bounded, but. There's no proof of that. So, I want to now switch to, unless there are any questions, I want to switch to the third and perhaps most, from my perspective, most interesting allocation scheme. And um, so let me get the right, right file for that. So this is uh, joint work with Shurav Chatterjee, Ron Pellet, Dan Romick, appeared in uh, the annals about three years ago. Um, it's based on earlier work of uh, Nazarov, Sodin, and Volberg, which was in the context of Gaussian analytic functions, and that was uh, kind of crucial for our work. So this is just repeating the kind of setup. This is the kind of allocation we'll get from this process, which is gravitational allocation. Particularly, it does yield provably connected domains. The one problem is that for random points, for uniform random points, this method will only work in dimension 3 and higher. It doesn't work in dimension 2. So in dimension 2, you can do this in finite regions, but not uh, 
in the infinite plane. However, you can do it in the infinite plane if your process has more rigidity than the Poisson process, so it does work for these Gaussian analytic functions or for a perturbed lattice. So, so I'm going to uh, skip kind of the general background on, that, on this process that you've seen and go to, to our work as I mentioned. So Nazarov, Soden, and Volberg uh, were interested for you know slightly different motivation in allocating area to the zeros of this Gaussian analytic function that I wrote here and they defined some gradient flow allocation um, although the process of the zeros seems like a more complicated process than the Poisson and it is more complicated in many ways for the purpose of this allocation it's actually simpler um, Anyway, let me jump to the way we define the allocation. So it's based on, based on gravity. So, right, so again, you have Z are the centers or stars that are going to get volume allocated to them. And on every other point in space, X, we have a force of gravity, which is just the sum of the forces from all these centers or stars. So if we're in d dimensions, we're going to use you know, Newtonian gravity. So the force of gravity is proportional to distance to the power d minus 1. And you can, um, or inverse of that, and you can realize that by just taking the vector z minus x and dividing it by distance to the d. Right? So this is a vector of force pointing um, from x to z, and its magnitude is the distance to the power 1 minus d. Okay, and, then, and, and now we want to sum these forces over all, over all the stars, z, and that indicates the force acting on a point x. So this kind of force was first considered by uh, Chandra Sekhar in the 40s, and he already observed that this series so well, it, ne it never converges absolutely, but even, uh, but even conditionally, it will only converge in dimensions 3 and higher. So, so if you just add this series in dimension 2, it's, it's always divergent uh, when the centers are random. But even in dimensions 3 and higher, it's important in what order you do the summation. So here, in order to get an invariant field, we're going to sum in increasing distance from the target point x. Now that's convenient because that automatically is defines a translation invariant um, force. It's not convenient for other purposes because if you want to start differentiating this according to x, then it's not convenient to have the variable you want to differentiate by including it in the um, uh, defining the ordering of summation. So you want to move to summation in a fixed order, and you can, but it turned out with a strange change. So let me, um, I'll come to that. Okay, so in order to understand what's the effect of changing the order of summation, let's define a two-variable function. So g o, g o of x is the force acting on x, but when the ordering is not according to x, but according to distance from another point u. Okay, so that's g of x. And I should say that initially we naively expected that as long as you add in increasing distance, it shouldn't matter where is the center because you know, this, uh, you're adding points in some order of shells and um, x and u are some fixed distance apart. It shouldn't, you know, for faraway points, x and u look like the same, but it turns out it does make a difference. So, so here's the exact statement. So if you look at g u x and compare it to g v x, so you keep the point x, so all the summons here are exactly the same, but the difference is just the order of summation, and changing, we know that by changing the order of summation we can you know, make a series go in, uh, non-absolutely convergent series go anywhere, but here the change looks rather slight. We're just changing the point al along which determines the ordering, but it turns out this change leads to a 
changing this sum. Now the value of this sum is a random variable, but when you move the center of summation from u to v, you get a deterministic change, which is just a constant, the volume of the unit ball times the vector going from u to v. Um, so, so the proof of this is just coming from kind of Newton's laws of gravity and um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip that part and just say so once uh, we need to do that in order to write the sum in terms of a fixed point and then we can uh, you know apply the theory of differential equations to that so so we look at uh, the flow curve determined by the equation gamma dot of t is f of gamma t so in other words let me, let me show, show a picture to show how these things look um, and it's easier to see it if it's mapped to a sphere. So here's okay. So this is the same thing happening on a sphere. So it's easier to see. So again, for every for every point in in space, y you look at this force field determined by all the centers or all the stars. Uh, and now the point is going to move according to this gravity. But this is uh, Aristotelian movement, that is the gravity is used as a gradient field rather than an acceleration. It's used as a velocity of an acceleration. So every point, when, when gravity acts as a gradient field, every point will fall into a star. It won't start circling stars because there's no inertia. So, um, <coughs> so, so for every point, the balance of the forces will lead it to go to some star. It's not necessarily the nearest star, um, except for a zero measure of boundaries that uh, where the forces balance. Now, here's the <laughs> here's so, so the formula you wrote that we might have thought was a force is a velocity. That's uh, right. That that that, that uh, well, we can define the gravitational force, but then the force we use it as a velocity, as a gradient field. Okay, to determine this allocation. And here, the beauty of it, w somehow, what's why this method is preferable to the others is that here, as I'll show you, we get unit of volume per point without kind of forcing it. So if you remember in this stable allocation picture, you know, center got sated when it reached unit volume. Here, nothing, you know, this, so the centers were partition so th I mean the centers were laid down so that there's on average one center per unit volume but this is just on average there are some areas where they're denser there's some areas where they're more sparse but this method yields exactly unit volume per each center and the proof is just an application of Green's formula which I'll show you uh, show you next so all right let me That's a big surprise. So, sorry? But that's a big surprise. That uh, unit <laughs> yes, yes. So that this was so uh, in fact this was first this connection was first observed in the Gaussian analog in the setup of Gaussian uh, zeros of Gaussian analytic functions by Sodin and Cyrilson and then exploited by Sodin, Nazarov and Volberg in their analysis of that Gaussian analytic function and we transported their idea to this uh, to this setup. So, so which point process is that there? Is that true? So, so this right so this is um, our theorem is for Poisson so for random points in dimension three and higher but uh, but then Nazar Sodin Volberg uh, so proved this for this for the zeros of this function in the plane, <coughs> although they didn't represent it this way. So they represented the um, the force not in terms of this sum, but rather uh, as the as the gradient of log of the so 
So this is the function f. They looked at the function log f and used its gradient to determine this force. Um, so, so in this in this case, there is a convenient. Uh, there's kind of a, it's m easier to define the force. We have to kind of construct the force by hand, um, but turns out the idea is similar. So. So as I told you, this is the force field that we're going to use as a gradient field. Um, and because we need to differentiate the force field, it's, we rewrite it ordering the stars in order around the fixed point, which we just choose to be the origin. But then there's a correction term coming from changing this summation, which is just this constant, the volume of the ball, times x. <laughs> okay. So now, why equal area in each basin? Okay, this is um, all right. So take a basin of attraction B of Z. These are all the points that fall into a certain star Z, and uh, okay. And look at the point X, which is on the boundary of such a basin. If n is the outward pointing normal vector at x, then the normal is actually orthogonal to the force at x, because the way these boundaries are defined, the force there is exactly balances, so the force is along the boundary. It doesn't point, if the, point, if the force would point into the basin, then, then this would not be a boundary, this would still be attracted to the star. So, so we get f times n is zero. So when we integrate over the boundary of the basin, this force times n will get will get identically zero. Now, what's the distributional divergence of the force? So we get right. So maybe I'll look again at the formula for the force. So we want to apply the gauss green so we want to understand what's the divergence of the force now uh, okay so the, so here we'll just uh, from this term we'll just get a constant so this correction term is actually going to be important this will just give us a constant but here we have singularities and so the force here is just the um, after all, it's just the gradient of the Newtonian potential. So if we're going to take its, di its divergence, <laughs> we'll so the divergence is harmonic except, well, so the, I'm sorry, so the divergence is going to be zero, except at these singularities. And these <coughs> singularities, what we'll get is just, I mean, this is the Laplacian of the Green function will just give us a Dirac. So, so in, in the end up, what we get with the divergence is d times the volume of the ball minus, again, d times the volume of the ball multiplied by these Dirac masses um, over, summed over the basin. But by definition of a basin, it just has a unique star in it. So there's a unique singularity. So, <laughs> so to conclude, we write the divergence theorem in this way. So this integral, which we know is zero, is the integral of the distributional divergence of f on the basin. And that, uh, okay, and that integral, what does it give us? We have to integrate this constant, so we'll get d kappa d times the volume. And then we have to subtract this minus the number of stars inside. And there's a unique star inside, so we get this, so the volume of the Basin must be one. Could you just repeat the last half sentence? <laughs> must be one. The last. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quarter of a sentence. <laughs> okay, so How did again, you? again, we we got. <laughs> all right. So so this integral was zero. This is the integral of f times the uh, times the normal. Okay. So this will be in equal to the integral of the divergence on the interior. Now, what's the divergence of this force? It has two, two terms in it. One is just coming, well, so the, the divergence has this constant minus uh, a contribution for each star. Each singularity converges, uh, contributes a Dirac mass 
to the divergence. But now when we're integrating this just over a single basin, only one of these singularities is inside the basin, the star that determines the basin. So we'll just get, now in, we integrate this, we'll get the volume of the basin, and this will get just, you know, this constant times one from the singularity. So this must be equal zero, so we get, we get one. And, you know, it's a, it's a case, so, now, the, um, so the key here that makes this work is the fact that this force actually does partition space into these, uh, into these basins that are bounded. And that's sort of a non-trivial point. That is, if, uh, if this set, if the set of stars, uh, you know, was not this, uh, invariant, translation invariant process, you could well have basins that are unbounded and then this application of uh, divergence theorem would be illegal. So there's, you know, some technicalities in proving that all the conditions of the theorem hold, but this is the kind of the key calculation. Um, okay, so, so for this, for these domains we can show in dimension three and higher that they are uh, have uh, very good behavior, so uh, they're much better behaved than the stable, uh, so the stable allocation at the critical case, it had power law tails, so we don't know exactly what the tails are, but we know they can't be too good. So in other words, uh, a point could be allocated to this, to a huge distance r away, and the chance of that is only constant over r, or constant over a power of r. While for the gravitational location, whenever it exists, that is in dimension three and higher, we get exponential decay. Okay, so the chance that you'll be allocated very far away decays very fast. Okay, and the proof of that involves uh, percolation arguments, and um, I'm going to uh, skip them and just say that there's We've done more precise analysis in a later uh, paper in GAFA of understanding ex the long tails that you can sometimes see in these pictures. What is their mass? But I think I won't, I won't go into that. Um, so, so let me show you though the random planar potential that uh, arose from this Gaussian entire function. So, so again, the first application of this type of idea was in the zeros of this function. And uh, so if, if, uh, if this is the function f, this is a picture of the absolute value of log f. And, and, so, and so here the allocation can be, so the absolute value of log f will be minus infinity at the zeros of f. And, and here the allocation can be thought of this way. So look at this surface. And for every, so this is the potential. So the, uh, the force field we're going to apply is the gradient of that. But you can think of taking this surface and at every point you could put a pebble and see if you leave a pebble there, where will it roll? It will roll into one of these holes which correspond to the zeros of f. And the basin of attraction of every zero is just all the initial locations where pebbles will roll into that location. And again, in this case, what uh, Sodin and Sirosson realized, and as our Sodin Volberg proved, was that the basin of attraction of every one of these zeros has exactly the same volume. Um, so, <laughs> there are many other nice facts about this, about this allocation. So this is, um, this is one of them, which which follows from Liouville's theorem. So, if you look at um, gamma a of t, so these are okay. Um, okay, th these are the points that will uh, fall into a, but take time at least t to do that then you can understand how that scales in time, but maybe I won't go. 
I won't go into that. And uh, let me stop here. Thanks for your attention. Right, right. So you still need some transition variant to be sure that the uh, that the regions remain bounded. But for instance, if uh, if you do this and ev assign every point a random mass, which is also uh, uniform in some interval, then you'll get an allocation where the area allocated to every star will just be proportional to its mass. So the pictures were two-dimensional, but I suppose this theory works the same in higher dimensions? Or? So the theory for random points Poisson, it works only in higher dimensions, only in dimensions three and higher. Um, so the problem in dimension two is that the force as you, the force act, when the points are at random, there's too much volatility. The force acting on a point doesn't converge. But if you have other arrays of points that are not as wild as this uh, completely uniform random points, then this makes sense and this works in two dimensions. So I started with this Gaussian analytic function, but a simpler case is uh, a perturbed lattice. Start with the lattice and take every point in the lattice and m give it a independent random perturbation, then this will work in two dimensions. But kind of our main interest was in this Poisson process, the limit of random points, and actually do all of this is in higher dimensions. Even though the, the, the pictures in the very beginning were two dimensions. The pictures? Yeah, the appetite. With the oh, oh. Okay, that uh, I thought you were talking about gravitational. So the yeah, so the stable allocation has the advantage that it works in all dimensions, including two. Right. So that works in two and higher. No, there's no difference there between two and higher dimensions. And, and can is there some possibility to say something about sort of the topology of this set? Because it's so it could be disconnected in dimension two, but maybe it's it's always it, it it can always in any dimension you have some disconnect mm -hmm. set. So it's easy to see if a center is hemmed in by other centers, then it will get a disconnected territory. Mm -hmm. This is different in the gravitational location, it's always connected. So even if a center is hemmed in by others, it will um, you know it, it will create a connected set which will include some kind of long thin tails that go in between the other the other centers. So, so it's, it's first, when you think of the gravitational location, it's first surprising if this is a center and, you know, and it's surrounded by, uh, by a bunch of other centers all around here, then it seems, you know, and, and suppose the area near it is much, much smaller than one. How is it, how is it going to get area one? Well, uh, it's going to get some area one which comes here. So, because these points here have, a, you know, will have an exact balance of the forces and miraculously <laughs> it will get exactly area one because, well, Green's theorem forces it to. But when you think of how it actually happens in specific arrays, it's very surprising. In other surprising cases, suppose you have a lone star. So we have a star, and this happens in the Poisson process in, in R3. You have a star, and distance a million away, there's nothing. Okay? All the stars, so this will, you know, once in e to the million cubed, this kind of thing will happen. So, so then you think, so here's a center, and, and the, everything is very, very far away. How come, and, and you apply this gravitational force, how come it's not getting, but in this case it will get almost exactly a ball around it, and then if you can, you can kind of do a calculation by hand to see if you have points, points that are outside this ball, then um, the they'll be attracted more to this, to, you know, these far away stars, and because, and, and this will, this only works exactly with Newtonian, gravi Newtonian gravitation. If you change the power 
in any way, this thing breaks down. As you see both from the Green Theorem and from kind of more direct calculations. But even after seeing the Green Theorem, we had to do, you know, we had to, to really be convinced, we had to see both the simulations and do calculations in specific cases, because at first it really seemed paradoxical. Right, so there's some... Bernie, have you, have you worked on that? So in, the, uh, in the planar case. Yeah, in the, in the entire function case, then I think there would be uh, a number... Every uh, point is incident to average of eight basins. And every basin is adjacent to eight-thirds. I can't quite prove this. I can prove this in the bounded case on, this, on the mean sphere. So it should be true. It should be true on the plane. But right. But so you, you have a paper yeah, with, with Steve Zeldich on yeah, this, the, right? Yeah, the, it's a consequence of the paper. Right. On, on, on the mean sphere. Uh huh. So. On the average. That's because it averaging. And, and the same thing is true. You know, maybe. Let's see. Even in the Gaussian analytic function case, the average no the average number of uh, local maxima is uh, going to be well. See, the average is the average number of local maxima is one third in the air region, one third the number of zeros, and the average number of critical points of, of <coughs> saddle points is four thirds. Of so, so that, so I, I guess if we use the fact that that the regions, I guess it, you have to worry how to define it in, in the uh, unbounded case because some regions may be very long, but the probability of being too long, you say, is exponentially decaying. Yes, it's exponential it's decaying. decaying so. so probably in the limit, it's probably also. Right. The exponential decay was also proved yeah, in this yeah, Gaussian yeah, analytic case. Right, but also, and so, so one just short final point about the you know uh, power of pictures in this business. So is the that picture for the polynomial zeros. So uh, right, for, right. I mean, this this is for this is for polynomial zeros on a sphere. So uh, so this uh, the idea for this kind of uh, allocation, as far as I uh, know, was first suggested by Sodin and Cyrilson, and I heard it from Misha Sodin in a conference in Stanford uh, in some some years back. And uh, so he told us this. Uh, he told he told me this definition, but he said, "Well, we noticed it, but we're not planning to work on it." I was really intrigued, but couldn't prove anything about it. Then I asked. Uh, student at the time, Manju Krishnapur, to simulate this and it took quite a while to find the, the right way to view it. But once we got the pictures, we sent them back to Sodhan. He said, wow, I'm going to drop everything and try to understand this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so then that led to the paper of Nazarov, Sodin and Volberg, which was, you know, then, le you know, was crucial later in the work, but uh, I think this, uh, you know, I was already intrigued, but uh, I couldn't have made the progress without uh, W without Nazar of Sodin Volberg's insights, um, which which really were motivated by understanding these kind of pictures. Okay.